talking a lot about finance. So Keith, do you have a question? Um, thank you, yes. My question is effectively um, a pricing of um, some thoughts of Julian Silverman, so it's a joint thing. Um, it would have been longer if Julian was in. Um, does the panel agree that as the starting point for its forthcoming spending review, Barnet Council should emulate Liverpool Council in the 1980s? Then, as now, there was no money. Yet, Liverpool Council persuaded the government to discover £20 million, this was the 1980s, the equivalent um, of £59 million pounds today, which allowed parks, sports centres and thousands of council houses to be built and created or saved thousands of jobs. Shall I go first? Uh, and of course the answer is no. Is that, that's fine. But uh, Mr Silverman always asks an interesting question and of course there's more to it than that simple answer. Of course we will be lobbying government to protect those things that we need to protect in Barnet. And Mrs Lever has raised an important point and I find myself agreeing with Alison Moore so that could ruin my party uh, prospects within the Conservative Party. But I think there is a recognition that it is the duty of those of us in politics to protect those people who need to be protected. And uh, I think that's very important. We might differ about them, the way that it is done, but all of us have to recognise that there is a shortage of money in Britain, the money's gone, and we have to make sure that we get the biggest possible bang for the buck. Like, we've got to make sure we get the very best value and give as much help as we can with the money that we've got. We can certainly campaign with the government to try and get more money if we can justify it. But every other borough in the country and every institution will be doing the same thing. It's very frightening when you get an indication of future spending plans that is broadly similar from the Conservative Party, from the Labour Party, and even more worryingly from the Treasury officials. So it is likely to happen, and preparation is the key to mitigating some of the harshest effects of that. And we have to make sure that we work very hard to do the very best we can to live up to the uh, the uh, the objectives that most of us had when we stood for election. None of us stood for election to be harsh and make life worse for people. Um, yes, by all means. Um, I, no, I, I acknowledge and I appreciate the concern that both parties have, all parties have. And what was said by Janet before, it is a very, very real problem. We have to recognize that in 50 or 60 years, the population has gone up by over 50%. So we have to recognize that population increase as an element in the whole question of care. The other element is personal. I was brought up in one of the poorest parts of London with no bathroom, kitchen under the cellar kitchens, and all the rest of it. We had very little very little indeed. But we have an enormous family support all the time, which doesn't exist in the same way today. The result was that it was perfectly normal for an ill, perhaps not as not the sort of person you mentioned, but an aging and ill person, to be looked after in the house by daughter, daughter-in-law. Uh, we looked after our, my mother-in-law for 18 years, uh, and other people have done the same. We haven't got that family set up anymore, sadly, and therefore there has to be institutions, there has to be personal, personal effort to link with people, to help people, which I mentioned before. May I, having referred to Alzheimer's, may I mention to you that Alzheimer's is now becoming known in the medical world as diabetes free. It's quite an interesting thought. Mm -hmm. Well, John, what about the money issue? Presumably you remember the 80s. I remember the 80s, and I remember before then, and I remember being a very really simple background in Sheffield. We did have a little toilet, but um, my grandfather didn't up the road. It was, you know, it was basic, but uh, you're right about the closer family ties of those days. And of course, people had fewer expectations. Also, they didn't live so long. I about with my two grandfathers, for instance, it's just an example. You know. One of them in another country, and one in this one. Um, we do strive. One of the points that in Barnum we've been trying to do is to, well, we have actually been successful in this, is to 
I'll put it, I'll put it crudely, not the heads of the NHS staff together with the social worker staff who are on a separate side of it you know, to a point. So that they work in together in cohesion. This is, I think, providing the small example that I've come across as a counsellor, seems to be working rather well. Once they've been pressed together, it, it, in other words, it, it's not sacking people, it's getting them to work more tightly together to get a better outcome. The leader is in fact emphasized more that bang for your bucks or whatever. Um, in other words, more services out of people who didn't realize perhaps they weren't providing everything they could. But then they work with colleagues and it's, it's collegiality which helps too. Talk about public services where it's not a profit motive, not a profit motive for the people doing the work. They are in fact dedicated people very much, mostly I find them delightful, hard working. But so they need another incentive, which is not money. The incentive is of doing an excellent job. And they like it when I think they are assisted by, shall we say, the local authority or whoever. Um, I did a, a small sub, a subcommittee on this called Task and Finish. Myself and three or four other colleagues from all party, no, no, no politics. And I, I think we helped it to push it along a little bit. That sort of thing can come from the town hall. Uh, it's sort of, you might call it the issue, if you like. Um, it's thinking hard and thinking how you can improve the service with the money and the people, the people you have. It's the quality of the people you have. And the quality, I think, in Barnett is pretty high. I, I'm very impressed by them. And to give them the kind of incentive that they need and need to care about. I mean, I speak to somebody whose wife is, has been bedridden for the last two years. Right, I've left her, I've done the food, left it for the care of feed her. So I know, you know, she has got Alzheimer's, but she's, her brain is gone because she's had strokes and burned four languages, PhD, the whole lot is gone. And you realize then, and that, if I wasn't there, she'd be in some kind of a boat. I mean, we have no children. If you're going to look after me, I'd do the same thing. Um, so I can sympathize. The NHS is wonderful. Today. They're providing the carers to do it. So I'm very grateful. We were paying first, but they decided to know our, our, our patient will have taken on the cost. I'm a bit ashamed, really, at the cost of it, you know, and self-conscious that I'm costing so much. Oh, it's all right, Mr. Hart, you've paid your taxes all your life, true, 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 but that's all been spent. You know, it's the, the attitude is that I will actually go and buy, go and buy medicaments. I say, well, let's only we get it, it's very expensive, get it, you know, for it. No, no, I'll buy it. Can I buy it? I think, yes, you can. I'll go to the chemist and buy it. To try and alleviate the cost of the NHS, which is massive. And if everybody did a little bit like that, and I think the doctors are now doing it, my prescription says, you know, on it, that uh, now uh, don't be surprised the name of your medicine has got a funny name, it's, but it is basically the same thing, but we're getting it cheaper, saving money. Good. The attitude is now growing in the public service. We've got to try and right, spread the money a little further, buy cheaper good, it's better, better provision, and so on. Yeah, these, these are small things, I must say, I'm just mentioning them, as small things I've observed. So it's the climate of the mind, well, the mindset in the public service, which is excellent, has to go towards thriftiness. Right, well, I think we have quite a few people from uh, the audience who would like to get in on this. Okay. Might I just uh, make, make one comment? Yes. I, I, mean, I think there's a real issue about making sure that Barnet argues its corner for resources. And I think that is also, we talked at the beginning about it being a nice place to live. And we then qualified that with the fact that it's a tougher call for a whole range of people across the borough. And there's a real challenge about not pitching us always as green and leafy and recognising the range of communities that we have together, embracing that challenge and actually being one community, asking, seeking the resources to to, to, to throw that circle. And actually not suggesting that people go with elsewhere because actually we are one community. One sentence in there. I'd really love to get the people from the store because I just want to come up back with something. One sentence. One sentence. Barnet is exactly average in terms of social deprivation in Britain. Exactly average. One hundred people. I'm just happy to hear that. I'm just going to come back on something that Councillor Hart said. I absolutely agree with you, Councillor Hart, and I think carers do the most wonderful job. But realistically, they're not provided by the NHS. They're provided by private companies. They are paid in a terrible way where for going from one 
um, little job to another. They're not paid for the journey in between. And why do you think they're going on strike in the very near future? Because their lives are terrible. I mean, they're a wonderful job. Yes, Councillor Hart. There's a very fine and what you've said, but I think you've forgotten your history. The purpose of the NHS was exact set up exactly for people who couldn't pay for their medication, who couldn't pay even for a visit to the doctor. So to suggest that everybody chips in with whoever they happen to be particularly friendly with and buy the medication or the food or whatever help it is they need is not, with, not thinking about the reality of most people's lives. Okay, I just wanted to uh, interrupt or disrupt this narrative of austerity that is stated as fact in this room. Tomorrow, there's going to be a huge national march against austerity. Austerity is a choice. It is not a force of nature that has landed on us in, you know, like a tsunami. It is a political choice and if you believe that, that it is not necessary that if you plug tax loopholes, if you scrap Trident and if you start properly managing the economy, we don't need austerity. I will make this one concession which is that austerity is, being, is this expressing itself almost exclusively through funding to local government. The Chancellor of the Exchequer has been borrowing and spending more than any other Chancellor ever. But what they have done where they have put austerity is on local government. That is our voice, our local empowerment is being deliberately eroded. And, um, and I, um, it infuriates me and it, it explains one of the reasons I'm here tonight. Just, if we can revert just for a moment to um, the original question, which was citing the example of Liverpool in the 1980s, when they found that, yes, money was available. Money is always available. Can I just quote, if I quote him right, um, Napoleon Bonaparte said something like, impossible is a word that exists only in the dictionary of people of weakness. Yeah. <laughs> This is the Councillor Hart. Um, you touched a sore spot with me when you started talking about generic and branded medicines. I hate to tell you this, and I hate to tell all of you, there is a slight difference. They won't tell you that. Some people it doesn't affect. Some people it does affect. Yeah. But the there pharmacist a... profit, the NHS doesn't say. Okay, come on, more, more. <laughs> okay. But there is a problem between, there, there isn't a problem, but there is an issue. Yes, well, there is a I'd like to come back to, to Keith's point, which is about the money. Because it's always about the money. Now, a few weeks ago, I was down in the city talking to a major financial institution, and they have got so much money. He said it is limitly, it, it, it is practically limitless our money. And in the square mile, there are trillions, and they really want to use that money, and they've got nowhere to get a, a decent return. We are spending a huge amount on housing benefit. You know, six percent of people in receive housing benefit are in work. It just seems that with financial institutions with huge amounts of money uh, sitting there doing very little, with a real need for things like social housing that could actually bring the, yeah, that could <laughs> that could bring the overall tax bill down. It seems to me that there is a huge common sense gap here and that actually we need to sit down and start talking about how do we plan and how do we make use of all that money that they want to lend on really competitive terms, incredibly competitive terms. It doesn't then affect public sector borrowing, doesn't affect it, but I, I just, it's, it seems to me there, that we are missing a huge trick here. But no, everybody thinks in straight lines. I would like to endorse fully what you said, sir. Okay, take I, the first train I, out on Monday morning. But, <laughs> uh, I think what you've touched on is very, very important. Uh, for example, body market has been revamped and resuscitated because of one of the very wealthy organisations. And if all the other financial bodies would have so much money, 
have some sort of social conscience about it and are brought forward to help in the, the, the areas which we've discussed, I think that would be a very, very important step. Mm. We don't want Victorian philanthropy. We want yeah, proper, yeah. responsible social services. Yeah. 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 Well, I just and I would just comment that actually, uh, you know, not, it doesn't tie in exactly with what John's saying, but there are, for example, local authorities across the country looking at how they might pool some of their pension fund money. Yeah. Now, there are risks to that, and you'd want to make sure it was absolutely sound, but, for example, to invest in house building, because you know you're going to have an income stream, and therefore it is an genuine investment, but the benefits socially of having good quality, social affordable housing, uh, and using that pension money <coughs> really gives a return, because believe me, at the moment, the returns are not great. Um, and, and it just, it, it seems to be a win-win if you were to do that. Yes, of course there were philanthropists like Peabody who actually built social housing and did that for all sorts of reasons. But I think we ought to be, and, and could be more, um, enlightened about how we use the money that's in the system um, to, to benefit the broader range of, 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 of the community. Because actually we all deserve, I mean, we deserve to have decent lives, and one of one of those elements of a decent life is decent, safe, warm housing um, that's not going to break your bank. Can I? Yes. Okay. Um, the housing issue is extraordinary. How do we manage to build so few houses every year? It's extraordinary. There's a need identified, and yet nothing happens. And this has happened for decades. And you're quite right, of course, there are limitless sums of money seeking a return, and yet it's not happening. And one finds it, the difficulty in setting up a new garden city, which seems a very sensible thing to do in the southeast, why is it not happening? I have no answer for it. It's certainly not a Barney thing, it's a national thing, Stop and it needs that. Remember those who need affordable housing and social housing. Yes, yes but, but, you you but, but we have an extraordinary national model. The way that affordable housing is financed is by the development of private housing. Yeah. It is an extraordinary system, and then it's, it only serves to make private housing less affordable and more expensive. And they always wriggle out of the social housing. Well, they don't, and they don't do they? They don't well, always. Do. But the West End, how many people in West End are going to have homes? There will be lots of new homes created. Yeah, who? Russian oh, oligarchs? No, they're Russian oligarchs. You're right, you're right. 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 You're Sorry, some people have had a lot to say. Is there anybody back there who is trying to get a word in and I haven't seen? No? Anybody up here? Okay, well, I think that that question was really about, if I may just put it this way, to all in a neutral way, uh, not waiting for the people with the money to come to you, but forging a plan from whatever background you have and going to them. That seemed to be, if I could just sum up what I've been hearing. So uh, we might obviously come back to that, but how about for a little change, just for a moment, a slightly cooler question. Hugh Weldon. Hugh? Yeah, good evening, everyone. 